Well, good uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Yeah, it is uh, it is evening. I think in most parts of uh, of Europe. Uh, well, thank you for joining us today, and we would like to welcome you to our second uh, live reflection session of the Sharing European Histories self guided course. The uh, self-guided course is part of the Sharing European Histories project, which is an initiative by the Evans Foundation and uh, Euroclio, the European Association of History Educators. And throughout this project, five teaching strategies were developed by a team of teachers, uh, researchers, and curriculum developers. They are now currently available uh, on our website in nine different languages and a few more languages a few more translations will be added very soon. And in addition to the live reflection sessions, we, um, yeah, we're also diving into the, the five different teaching strategies with local teachers and local experts uh, across Europe to see how they have used the uh, teaching strategies to develop their own lesson plan. And um, yeah, in some cases also to execute the lesson plan in the classroom. My name is Eugenie and I am Euroclio's operations coordinator and project manager of Sharing European Histories. And together with my colleague, Birgit, um, who is also here today, um, we will dive into uh, two teaching strategies. Uh, first one up is using commemorative practices to teach that history is a constructed narrative, which is developed by Joanna Voidon. She's here. And uh, the second one on analyzing historical figures to understand how and why they are perceived differently by Gentian Dejia, and he's also here with us. Um, Joanna and Gentian, could I ask you to introduce yourselves? Perhaps Joanna, you could start. Okay, so um, uh, hello, I'm Associate Professor at the Institute of History at the University of Wrocław in Poland. Uh, so mostly my job is to teach prospective um, teachers uh, because um, I'm in charge of the unit that specializes in methodology of teaching history and civic education. And I have been cooperating with Euroclio in, on several occasions for more than 10 years now, um, I think. And my research, historical research also involves um, propaganda of the communist regime and public history and the Polish American history. That's basically it. Thank you very much. We're very happy to, uh, yeah, to have you here for, uh, for this reflection session. Gentian, hello. Good evening, everyone. Hello. Uh, okay, I'm a history teacher and uh, also I, I am a member of the History Association of Al the Teachers of Albania and uh, uh, also, I have uh, several years that I cooperate with uh, uh, Europea, so I, I am focused in history and uh, why we are here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, very shortly, Birgit will just very, uh, yeah, very briefly uh, uh, introduce the two teaching strategies. And then we will continue, uh, actually start with the reflection session with both Joanna and Gentian. And in the end, we will also have some, uh, some space for discussion. And actually, Yurai and Bista, who you probably already know from the uh, pre-recorded sessions are here with us uh, as well. Um, so uh, yeah, they, they might share uh, some of their comments uh, and their experiences uh, towards the end of the session. Um, Birgit, could you please introduce the teaching strategies? Yes, I can. So now we've had a little bit of an introduction uh, to the authors, to the different, uh, yeah, the makeup of the course. If we go into depth a little bit more on comparative uh, own commemorative practices, uh, the strategy aims to show that history is presented in public places and also in history, broadly speaking, um, as a constructed narrative, and that one should approach uh, this very critically. It reveals how history is consumed both outside the classroom and also beyond textbooks. And it asks students to look for diversity in representations. So that was commemorative practices. As for historical figures, uh, the strategy aims um, to analyze key figures from the past and also uh, more recent times. It asks students to take one single figure and to analyze them and how they are perceived, how they may be remembered, 
across different places and across different time periods. So both of them ask students to look very critically at history. Um, now we will begin with the, yeah, with the reflection. We have our wonderful authors here. I would like to ask, uh, I'm very curious about your inspirations uh, for the strategy, how they came about. I know that you uh, also worked together to um, make the strategy to develop it as we now have it. Um, yeah, I'm curious, tell me a little bit more. Maybe Joanna can uh, kick us off. Okay, so I must say that uh, the original idea uh, comes from a totally different project, which is a research project of my colleague um, under quite a complicated title of cohesion building of multi-ethnic societies from 10th until the 21st centuries. And it mostly focuses on the Middle Ages. And um, it was financed by one of the national programs. It's called um, National Program of Development of Humanities in Poland. Uh, so, and, and this project is chaired by Professor Przemysław Wiszewski um, from our institute. Today, he's the rector of our university, but when he got it, um, he was um, involved more on research and less on, uh, on administrative um, things. And he asked me uh, to uh, help um, with translating this um, research findings uh, into something practical, applicable to schools, mm -hmm. um, which he put into, into the project so, um, so that it had um, a kind of a broader audience um, that it's not only focused on, on academia. Mm. And I must say that it was quite a challenge because those research findings uh, were really difficult to grasp uh, for academics even when I thought, well, how to do it, how to deal with it uh, so that it's digestible uh, to school to school children. I decided not to go uh, like um, case by case uh, in this research, but rather to find something that is um, kind of independent, though inspired by those findings. And so um, I used the concepts of uh, Peter Sakes of uh, developing historical thinking and trying to uh, find the examples of those multi-ethnic societies from the past and to um, put it into the framework of this um, famous big six um, ideas of historical thinking. And um, uh, one of them uh, was historical significance. Mm -hmm. um, and here I found the path of history in Wrocław, my home city, which had quite a complicated history because it belongs to several states, um, uh, starting from, um, Poland, then Czechia or Bohemia, rather Bohemian Kingdom, then Aust Aust Austria or Habsburg Empire, then Prussia, um, then Germany, and then Poland again. Uh, and um, this path was created after the collapse of the communist regime, uh, when um, Wrocław started uh, to look back at its past and it tried to um, bring those different heritages uh, to the fore. So um, I, th I thought it, it was a good um, point of entry for the discussion, what should be, what could have been commemorated there and uh, whom this commemoration represents, to what extent the decision makers who developed this particular path took into consideration non-Polish perspectives. And that was like the basis for, for my proposal to look in general on um, at our streets, at our cities, at our places, and to um, regard uh, them as um, places where different layers of the past are commemorated mm -hmm. with, and, that, um, and try to think who can be satisfied with the commemoration and who not, not necessarily, because I thought 
for example, of let's say a German or a Czech tourist coming to Wrocław and looking for their history, uh, which spanned for ages, which is hardly ever mentioned uh, in the public spaces um, of the city. And Jewish uh, past or um, Jewish population is uh, almost totally neglected. So um, that's how this strategy um, was inspired. Perfect. Uh, I, I actually uh, love the way you described it, that there are these different layers of history, right? And how that, yeah, even uh, how you can take one place and that it is, yeah, so differently looked at um, if you go across a period of time. Um, and then you actually have to dig up layer by layer to be able to see the different representations and know what you see today is the buildup of many, many years. Um, Gentian, I'd like to uh, ask the same question to you. Uh, what uh, inspiration uh, did you have for the strategy? And uh, did you think that there was a need for the strategy too? Uh, yes. Uh, during the European project IPACT, we had a survey in Western Balkan, and I was the national coordinator of that project. And uh, I remember that. Uh, the survey in the Western Balkans had sensitive topics to, uh, talking about figures and uh, their leadership during their time. So, uh, and during my teaching experience, I, uh, every time I saw the students had problems to figure the figures uh, that are mostly politically and uh, sometimes prejudice of their nationalities uh, or other things uh, that they are not uh, developing uh, a lot of knowledge. And uh, here is mixed with uh, social media sometimes that uh, makes a figure traitor or hero is dependent from the point of view. And this, in this perspective, uh, I thought to bring examples of figures, uh, not only contemporary, but also medieval and ancient time to, to, to bring them figures that, okay, we can see in difference. And uh, during the, uh, the project, uh, Ocean European Histories, uh, we concluded to use one figure. And uh, as uh, we have mentioned one figure there, uh, that we can develop it and we can see it in different perspectives and in different, uh, how it's prescribed in different textbooks. Uh, that was uh, something that was neat to see a figure. Uh, and this is enforced from the movement of monuments, you know, that uh, we have figures now that are very discussed. Uh, uh, what is the legacy. So we have to bring that in classroom and mm -hmm. where is better to, to bring to the students uh, the information and uh, the figures uh, with uh, not a typically a national, uh, nationalized uh, view, but in different views, internationally sometimes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and um, perhaps be yeah, before we continue with the rest of the reflection, it would also be uh, nice to um, yeah, shortly elaborate on the, 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 the learning objectives of each strategy. So um, perhaps, Joanna, I can start with you again. Um, what did you want students to get out of this strategy? I think generally it uh, has already been mentioned, yes, so that they um, look um, at uh, their surroundings, at, at the, the places they visit from a point of view of historian or public historian, and that uh, they see that the surroundings are not just there, but they are constructed, and that someone makes a decision what should be commemorated, 
and um, at the same time, even if it's not actively what should not be commemorated, although such decisions are also sometimes made, but if you promote one group events, certain things, um, you make some choice because you um, send others into oblivion. And so that um, the students, um, the pupils, ask such questions wherever they are, uh, what is promoted and what is not, and um, maybe why and how did it change in time. So it's a kind of this, um, I don't know even how to say it, because it's not skill, it's rather an attitude towards uh, the places you are visiting. Yeah, yeah, perhaps an attitude or uh, awareness, mm -hmm. perhaps, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Hentian, how about how about you? How about your strategy? For me, it's very uh, important to bring uh, figures in classroom and not letting them out of classroom. And in only in social media, the teacher, the history teacher has uh, to, to bring them in classroom. And that is my main objective. objective. Sorry. And uh, also, uh, it's important uh, uh, that the students can know uh, in the history, their history. And uh, we had uh, real problems. Uh, for example, are some ancient figures uh, that also are discussed which na na nationalities they belong. That is uh, something that, OK, we have 2,000 years, and we are discussing for that figures. And uh, we are raising monuments of it, comparing uh, which the monument is bigger or which is more important and uh, who has the right, etc. But bringing them uh, in different points of view in classroom mm -hmm. will be better for the future uh, and not only the official narrative. That is the object. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Exactly. It's all about... I think changing the narrative and also yeah maybe awareness is like a really good word for this if you are aware of the different perspectives um and of the yeah multiplicity and kind of yeah, diversity of opinions then you can really um get closer to the truth and uh yeah the actual history behind it um, but now I'm quite excited because we have the teaching strategy it's been developed as we say it's been published um, in these nine different languages um, which you can access on the website um, it's even been a, applied now in the local context so we have Jura and Bistra who uh, created wonderful lesson plans um, what would you like teachers to get out of the teaching strategy what do you think the main benefits of it are Maybe we can kick off with uh, Joanna. Hi, I'm not sure if uh, if I know it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's the question uh, to the teachers to be asked. But um, my message would be that um, history is not happening only in the classroom, but mostly uh, our students or our graduates are facing and will be facing history everywhere. And so the role of the teacher is of, of a history teacher is to prepare them to um, interact with all those different messages related to the past that will surround um, their uh, students outside the classroom. That teaching history is not for the classroom and for the exams, but it's for their uh, everyday life and. Uh, their leisure and their work, but generally for for their real life, not for for the school life. That would be my main message to uh, to the teachers. And uh, yeah, I think that is very true. We all look at history from the framework of this is a lesson. This is what I will teach my students today. But it's so much more than that, because like you say, it's in everyday life. And in the end, um, yeah, it forms a huge part of who you are and how you understand the people around you. And Gentian, I'm curious, let me know uh, 
let me know what you want students to take out of your teaching strategy. Uh, what I am saying is very important. Figures are important for a moment of history, but we have to see their background. We have to see uh, in all the perspective and maybe that is the moment of the figure that is coming in power or is developed uh, as a political or other perspective, but we have to, to deal uh, and uh, we have to deal with the official narrative that uh, is more politically and uh, more uh, national and uh, that can be uh, problems uh, with uh, other communities and uh, why is to see in different views and uh, i'm not uh, against uh, articles and uh, using them in social media but we have to bring them in in uh, history classrooms that is very important because uh, the teacher is not only a person that inspires but is the, uh, he inspires also critical thinking about everything and we if we will have a society and a community of students that are using more critical thinking on the political figures and uh, others uh, i think that the society will be more better in the global view and uh, the civic uh, of goodness will be improved thank you mm -hmm. yeah Oh, thank you very much. Um, this might be a little bit of a, of a tricky question, um, but if you would have had the opportunity to rewrite the strategy as it, uh, as it is now, um, is there anything that you, you would have done differently that you would have changed or maybe added or, yeah, any, anything that might uh, come to your mind, Joanna? <laughs> <laughs> Again, maybe it's too early to ask uh, this question. Um, mm -hmm. Honestly, at the moment, I would like to see how the strategy works. And it's not because I'm so proud of myself, uh, but rather I must say that I really enjoyed how this whole project worked. That it's, uh, yeah, okay, it is, let's say, my strategy and um, it was my initial idea, but in fact, it was a collaborative work. And um, Unlike in the original project, it was not that I had to, you know, struggle um, with those lots of aspects and use my intuition um, and um, yeah, be alone with this masses of material. Um, not at all. I had support. I had all those good questions, all those good discussions. So I think we really made... Um, a lot of adjustments to this initial idea already during the project. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are also um, some options um, mentioned at the end of the strategy, some suggestions how it can be changed. So at the moment, honestly, I would uh, leave it as it is. And I would mm -hmm. uh, highly recommend this way of developing teaching materials as a collaborative effort uh, where the author is not, you know, left um, himself with everything. Thank you. Yeah, no, absolutely. That, um, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Gentian, how do you reflect on this? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, if you, uh, we are uh, talking about figures, figures can be uh, more complex and uh, we can find that not only in political, we can find in art, we can find also in sport, uh, everywhere. Uh, that uh, what I can suggest, you can, we can use all, uh, all, all the kinds of figures to, if they, we, if the teacher thinks that uh, that can improve the teaching. And uh, as Joanna mentioned, uh, there was a collaboration in a group and. Uh, the initial idea was developed and uh, in and this final uh, can be used and can be developed uh, in uh, all kinds of figures that teachers that is the freedom of uh, the teacher and he can uh, definitely find 
a way to be more attractive of his students. Uh, I am a teacher, but I know my students and I know uh, what my target group is. So every teacher has a target group and uh, has to choose a figure that uh, belongs to them. I'm actually going to stay on the topic of uh, the development of the strategy and how it works in, uh, in, in practice. Um, so as we've discussed a little bit, it's not necessarily easy or perhaps straightforward uh, to develop such a strategy from scratch. And I know you mentioned that it was actually a collaborative uh, process where all the authors were involved in fine tuning the strategy. Um, would you say that there were any challenges you faced when you were busy making the strategy? And how did you overcome these strategies? Okay, so I think I have mentioned already um, the biggest challenge um, prior to this very project by Evans Foundation and Euroclio. So how to um, translate academic findings into the teaching practice. Um, so it was um, really a challenge. Um, and I'm not sure if I managed entirely to, to overcome it. Uh, so that's why I'm specifically and especially grateful for Euroclio to help me work on this particular strategy and to um, bring my initial idea to something digestible. And another, I don't know if it's a challenge, but um, maybe, and again, I'm really grateful to Euroclio uh, that they are open to um, basing um, such, let's say, universal strategies on the local examples from the city like uh, Wrocław, which is, um, you know, just a city that maybe a lot of people even don't know that exists or where it is. Mm -hmm. Usually when um, we are teaching history, also in Poland, you know, it's based uh, in London, in Berlin, in Paris, uh, or at least in Warsaw, but not um, on, on those local um, areas. And um, it was um, a question whether it would work. Uh, yes, when you when you take such a um, from the first point of view an important or insignificant example of just one tiny street uh, in Wrocław and how you can make it universal. Mm -hmm. And um, I watched uh, the pre-recorded session by Uri and. Um, if he managed to implement it in his town, I think it is transferable. So I think um, it worked. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the challenges which you mentioned, those of history teachers will recognize because um, in your case with the research which you developed, then you had to kind of transfer that into something which could be digestible uh, for students. But in history, generally speaking, there is sometimes a lot of information. And so you need to be selective and to be able to teach it in a way which uh, is also suited to students. Um, Gentian, tell me, did you also encounter any challenges or reach a point when you thought, I don't know how to solve this? Um, and if so, how did you overcome those challenges? At first, when uh, my practice was chosen, uh, to be part of the project uh, with uh, Euroclio and Evans Foundation. Uh, I thought, okay, this is a local based uh, practice and how that will be included in a European level, like was the aim of the project. And, uh, but step by step and uh, meeting by meeting that we fortunately had before the pandemic, so we had possibilities to meet uh, and to discuss that in face-to-face uh, uh, -face, and that helps uh, teachers uh, to, to, to improve. And that was one of my challenges and that we uh, go beyond that. And the other, when I was, uh, because the day was released, the video, and I was uh, following of the Bistra, uh, plan and really I appreciated uh, how she introduced a figure from the Bulgaria 
and uh, how that was implemented in the lab in the local uh, level of Bulgaria. So uh, that inspires me and that uh, brings me to think that uh, that can be uh, the challenge now it's off because uh, th that can be used from other uh, locally. Uh, I am uh, to bring uh, this uh, practice in local level because uh, and I am the challenges for the teachers and also for me was uh, is uh, to find uh, local figures uh, that can be used, can be known mm -hmm. because uh, uh, figures that are locally known uh, can be can inspire uh, students and can help them understand better but involve, involve them in a, in a historical level, um, maybe in world level or, uh, or more national level, because, okay, also here where I live in a town, in a village, I have near the history. So the teachers had to do that and to, to inspire students to say that also you, you are part of history and maybe the history can be more attractive at that moment. Thank you. I think that's definitely the case for local history is that it can seem more personal to students who are learning about it and how they can see their, their little uh, village or their town playing a greater part in history. So using local examples was definitely um, something that we encouraged and that we are very happy that uh, then yeah, we achieved at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, moving into perhaps a, a very uh, uh, yeah practical question, um, just to help teachers on their way. Let's say, uh, could you perhaps elaborate a little bit on how this, uh, how your strategy can be adapted to meet different needs from students? So perhaps different paces of learning, um, different levels, uh, or yeah, any any other differences that that might be that might be there, Joanna. If we start with you. Um, okay, I think in uh, in the case of this strategy, uh, the most challenging thing is uh, to organize an excursion. Um, if uh, because. Um, I don't think it, it, it's um, the difficulty lies in the pace of learning or on the students' levels. Of course, it's up to the teacher to formulate the questions. Uh, the mm -hmm. very young students can, can um, have problems grasping various social groups or ethnic groups, but then you can um, explain it's up to the teacher just to explain it to them. But going outside of school, in order to look for um, uh, those commemorative objects might be a challenge. At least in Poland, it's more and more paperwork, permissions, mm. uh, weather, COVID and all this stuff. Yeah. But in this case, I think you I showed that you really don't have to go outside. Uh, you can use photos, um, you can use Google Street View even. Uh, and explore the things um, that are there. In fact, in a different uh, lesson scenario, I was able even to zoom in uh, using Google Street View to see one commemorative plaque and to uh, just discuss with, or um, ask the, the teacher to discuss it with, with the students. So um, yeah, that would be uh, my tip, not to be discouraged with, uh, um this obstacle mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh Hentian, how would you uh for the teachers yeah. sometimes it may be difficult to find information or have to have time to work on it that uh, can be a challenge because uh, when we are analyzing a figure uh, we have to find different uh, perspective views and we have to collect materials. Uh, maybe uh, a teacher in the future, uh, we can collect, uh, normally the teacher can work on 
different figures and, uh, and uh, have files on that, um, having uh, this information. The other challenge that can be for teachers is uh, how attractive, attractive will be for students. Not all the students uh, like to read a lot of uh, readings mm -hmm. and uh, that is another challenge and uh, how we he can work on that yeah so uh, we've just covered yeah maybe like a couple of challenges uh, but that can be overcome as we've seen in the case of joanna that it, it doesn't matter if you cannot plan an excursion because you can still use google maps to your heart's extent that I'm sure after a year and a half of the pandemic that we can still um, be able to give uh, digital lessons which can use this strategy. And then uh, Gentian, you mentioned that sometimes uh, sources may be hard to find. Um, and luckily we have in this case that there are two already ready to go lesson plans, I like to call them, where the sources are already all identified. And as you mentioned, sometimes there is a lot of uh, writing or reading um, and yeah this can I guess sometimes be modified um, depending on the age of the students or on their ab ability um, but now we have one final question uh, to do with any last tips or tricks that you'd like to give educators who have listened now to this recorded uh, session this morning and also this live reflection any last pieces of advice that you'd like to give them? Huh. Um, I would probably suggest them not to be discouraged if there is no history path in their town or uh, if there are no big monuments. There must be something uh, which is a form of commemoration. Um, maybe a street name um, or street names, uh, name of the school. I don't know if it's uh, it works in this way also in other countries, but in Poland, most most school have uh, schools have their names. With, uh, with my students, I ask them to go around the building uh, of the university and to uh, note down all the plaques that are placed on the university. And they uh, came back to me last year and they told me that they did not even realize that there are so many people and events commemorating on one building um, in the city. And maybe one last idea that just came to my mind as for those vir virtual excursions, perhaps we can also use video games as a tool of those virtual excursions, um, like Assassin's Creed that we as teachers are not maybe so enthusiastic about, but our students are. So um, maybe it's also an option to develop a lesson plan based on Assassin's Creed, thanks. And Gentian, for you, any last uh, gems of advice you'd like to give to educators who want to now use one of these teaching strategies in their lessons? Uh, sometimes talking for figures may be a sensitive uh, topic and uh, mm -hmm. sensible in the community where they live. But uh, every time, in every country, in every place, we have uh, uh, moments that history and figures are talked. For example, uh, there were mentioned uh, a name of the school. Maybe we can use that and seeing how that is perceived in the community, this figure. So that can be uh, used that as a, a tool of uh, history teaching uh, for a moment. And also in uh, in social media, in newspapers, or et cetera, in TV, there can be figures uh, discussed. For example, uh, I'm inspired for, from the day uh, in my TV uh, that in my country, there was a discussion about a figure uh, that is very interesting that during the communism time that was uh, making funny for them, that was an important figure and uh, where uh, registered uh, movie about that. And uh, there are some funny sayings about him, but today how 
uh, that can be rehabilitated this figure that is not true what is said and uh, that is a deal a deal and the teachers can do can uh, can use that figure i can use uh, additional uh, information about it and uh, that students can understand better uh, uh, for example there can we can bring a film that is like uh, i mentioned uh, that is linked with figure but the film can be linked with a, a moment of history how it is uh, told also with a painting for example i remember okay uh, the details but now i remember when i was in Warsaw in gallery of art that was a painting of a manifesto if i'm not wrong and uh, uh, that can be used also the countries that can uh, come with a, a communist uh, regime heritage they can use uh, paints books films also in the name of figures so we can expand uh, not only analyzing uh, figures but analyzing also objects sometimes that are today uh, some years before here in albania in one of castles was a discussion about uh, inscription a black one that uh, was uh, uh, was uh, implemented one, from one of sultans uh, and uh, there was uh, it was in museum but uh, they want uh, institutions wanted to uh, put that in its place but uh, there was a great reaction and uh, that was put again in the museum because of the legacy that can be used that figure of sultan maybe can be used i i not i am not mentioning it for uh, uh, to be discussed in classroom in that community and bringing uh, different versions from the uh, national history or textbooks how that is described but also bringing the history in the other part of ottoman empire for example uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, moments to analyze in history so we can use that i love that idea of that there is history everywhere um, whether it's in your streets in your local environments um, yeah, any, anywhere essentially. And um, you just need to pick out one example. And I'm sure it would be relatable to any of the teaching strategies that we have developed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, no, absolutely. And I think uh, all the teaching strategies leave a lot of room for flexibility as well and adaptability. Um, Thank you very much for, for the reflection, uh, both Joanna and, and Gentian. We uh, still have a little bit of time for um, yeah, a little bit of a discussion or any questions that uh, the participants today might have. Um, maybe a question I have. Um, Joanna, you, you already mentioned that uh, uh, it might be best to ask the teachers what they got out of the strategy uh, themselves. And uh, today we are in a very unique position that we actually have uh, two, um, yeah, uh, two creators of the lesson plans here with us. So um, I'm curious to, to hear from Yudai and Bistra. I know you already touched upon this a little bit in the recorded sessions, uh, but for anyone that is, uh, uh, yeah, seeing this for the first time, I am uh, just wondering what did you, as um, yeah, uh, as an educator, got out of the strategy uh, in in developing your lesson plan? Um, perhaps you and I, you could start if you if you like. Okay, uh, I'll try. Thank you, Eugenie, uh, for the question. As as you know, I did it in a hybrid way, in tandem with teacher at the. At the high school, I was online, so all the students and the teacher could see just my face, the head that was up upon them. And I gave the instructions uh, in tandem with the teachers. They got all the assignments in uh, printed out form. And what I got out of it, like that I didn't expect, is uh, 
the their interest that it sparked their interest about the public space they live in that they go through every day just a second because i need yeah, to course. calm down the <laughs> <laughs> also want some of the limelights <laughs> yeah yeah uh, so uh, yeah i know it's it's a very long time for him for me not to be present and play yeah. with him yeah. So I will continue. So the interest, because uh, I gave them assignment uh, as, as home assignment to write down a few things. And one of them was uh, what they would like to explore in relation to that, uh, to that public spaces that they have seen in the... In So this is the, yeah. the thing that I love most, that it sparked the interest. And they really wanted to know more about all the, all the events and figures that were mentioned in the lesson. So this is the thing that I, I did not expect that would hit that hard, all, all the students in the group, because there were 16 students. And I think that half of them wrote in the home assignment that they would love to explore this, this topic or this figure more. Yeah. No, that's uh, that's great to hear, and also very uh, very exciting to hear. I, I imagine also for Joanna, um, yes, Bista. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's probably a future student. It's uh, a future student. Is, uh, yeah, yeah, in, yeah, no patient to wait. <laughs> uh, so I realized when I was uh, uh, thinking about. Uh, this strategy on historical figures uh, that uh, it's not only question of the narratives, uh, which is uh, problematic. Uh, you know, this uh, uh, topic, it's almost eternal man in history. There is so many uh, aspects of uh, reflection on this, but I realize how many myths uh, were created uh, among a very famous uh, historical figures. And because today is 2nd of December, it's a very uh, huge date, uh, I mean, concerning uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, because this is uh, the beginning of the first empire in France and this, uh, I mean, uh, exceptional moment of self-coronation, which is a really something act of uh, completely uh, disturbing the order of uh, this uh, uh, procedure. Uh, from the antiquity till the beginning of 19th century. So I realized how it's easy when I was dealing with uh, uh, searching for sources, uh, uh, not to uh, go on the site uh, on Georgi Markov, on this site of, uh, you know, of a really spy novel from the era of Cold War, which is really, uh, how to say, there was another cliche, which uh, quite a lot. It's very um, useful. And I think this strategy of historical figure, it's uh, really uh, useful to deconstruct all those uh, uh, myths, all those uh, you know, rumors, uh, which uh, were uh, announced as historical facts, but they are not. So in some way, uh, students could uh, uh, see how uh, work, uh, it's like a uh, detective work to make and to uh, find the uh, real reliable information uh, on the basis of sources and build their own uh, point of view, which is, I think it's probably the higher um, competence at school uh, history education dealing with uh, this uh, uh, problem. Mm -hmm. And also I realized that uh, in the beginning of my professional life uh, as a um, history teacher, uh, during one of uh, my first uh, Euroclio annual conference, since I met a very nice uh, history teacher from Denmark. And he say it was for me, how to say, it's uh, like uh, something very unusual. He said that uh, after so many years of professional uh, working, he told that uh, the main purpose is that students could realize the names of the streets, the name of the position of the monuments to understand why one street was 
renamed and after square was rebuilt with another monument. So in some way, I'm trying probably to combine both strategies, but in reality, in reality, this is a very important skills and competence for students to think critically, not to be easy to manipulate, not to repeat myths, but at least facts. So I think it's very good that now uh, teachers uh, get all those uh, packages of strategies to deal and to work more easily with their students. So thanks to the authors and of course to the project. Yeah, I think in, you have on the one side helping students to think more critically and then this is a perspective which they can take forward and actually apply to anything. Um, and then you have on the other hand really inspiring students like, for example, Yura, you were saying that they could even come to the teachers with ideas. And I think as an educator, to have that kind of energy given back to you is actually like a wonderful blessing. Um, I would like to open the floor to any other questions. Uh, don't be shy, you can just stick up your hand. Um, or if you want, you can also write a question in the chat. Um, but if I don't see any questions, I also have one myself. I will, uh, I will kick start with that one. Um, we did go into a little bit of depth on the topic of, okay, this is a very local example. This is specific maybe to, yeah, this, this street or this town. Um, and we also covered that actually there are many benefits of using local examples. Um, my question is how easy is it to actually incorporate um, a local example into the national curriculum? Because uh, I understand that there may be some conflicts or it may be difficult to tie it to the broader curriculum. How, how easy, maybe this is a question for Yurai and Bistra, how easy did you find it to situate that lesson within the wider uh, curriculum of your class? Uh, if, if I can uh, answer, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, very easily, because we have, uh, <clears throat> as I explained during the recording, uh, uh, learning outcomes were based on the Bulgarian history curriculum, and there are several standards mm -hmm. uh, requiring uh, some uh, uh, skills from students. So in this way, um, our local, uh, it's almost national mm. uh, because in fact, it's not really a local, it's not only in one city. In fact, the biography of the, this historical figure, uh, Georgi Markov, he was living in Bulgaria, in Sofia. After that, he was working in the Western Europe. So there is a, quite a lot of uh, options to be incorporated uh, as uh, some example of the other movement during the communist regime in some way. It's not uh, uh, like revolutionary movement, but it's however, it's about the opposition of uh, the main uh, ideological mm -hmm. uh, system uh, during this period. And I think uh, uh, more figures like this, students got a more rich picture of the past because they could uh, compare, they could compare different uh, facts of uh, uh, behavior of people, of their acting, it's not in very easily uh, conditions, mm -hmm. or how they could react to some dangers, or how they react to some uh, uh, negative uh, events in the society, what mm -hmm. should be, they should uh, be quiet or they should speak. So it's uh, quite a lot of questions, uh, which is reflect not only on history teaching, but also there is some uh, elements of civic education, of course. Uh, uh, if you want to make uh, pe um, young people to realize that democracy, uh, that freedom is not something uh, granted, mm -hmm. uh, in this way, they have to make their own uh, a real conviction of this, and uh, especially to uh, appreciate uh, all those uh, uh, democratic values of society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that is very true. Um, Georgi Markov, who was your historical figure that you based your lesson plan on, he is 
an example, perhaps you could say, of a dissident, uh, someone who was, yeah, kind of clashed with the ideology of the system at the time. So you can almost very easily piece that as part of a, as one little puzzle piece in the greater jigsaw. And uh, Yurai, if you're able to speak, how do you reflect on, on that? Uh, I'll try. And uh, can, you, can you please repeat uh, your question? Yes, of course. Um, so we mentioned that a lot of the lesson plans and case studies we picked were very local in nature. Did you find it difficult to situate that or to plan it in the wider curriculum? Uh, actually, not for my case, but uh, I'm not a history teacher. I work with history teachers. Uh, and at the same time, I researched local archives. So I'm um, between many worlds and I had the, you know, the advantage of to see what is inside. That's why I have created it in a way that uh, the students could look like through three different memory layers, through three different pasts of the same central place of the town. And in this context, it is not that usual for teacher to, to have sources like this. So I'm glad that teachers can have this right now. And they are thankful for having resources like this because they are facing so much bureaucracy that they don't have time to really to dig for sources. They can use what is available, published in books or thanks to the boost of technologies in the last 20 years, what is on Facebook or online. There are sources, there are contextualized information that they can use, but it's there are none so not so much or from my point of view, I don't see that many. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I have to point to a educational standards in our country, because for many years, they encourage and they instruct teachers to connect national history, because it's still dominant type of narrating in the history, in the school history, with local context. But at the same time, there are not so many examples how to do it. That's why I'm very thankful to Joanna for developing this strategy. And maybe in time, there will be many more examples, with many more sources teachers can use in very, I would say, small local context, like in my hometown. Because it's a, it's a regional town, but still there are so many things that we can connect, even with the national history, even with analytical history. But it will take many more years to, to develop these things. We'll see. And uh, now I remember one thing, sorry for all, all this moving because I'm still checking the little kid because uh, <laughs> already already plotting another thing on me. So uh, I will just share with you my last idea that knowing what teachers use in the local and peripheral context in my country, I, I understand that they use what they have at hand, sometimes like basic information, tour guides, and they connect it like to those figures that are in school history. But it is more important for them to look also through many different layers and to contextualize them more. That, that's why I, I think that uh, this strategy goes this way. So yeah, and thanks for the opportunity to be part of this. Thank you so much, Yara. It's great to hear um, how, yeah, both of you actually um, do see local uh, cases fitting within the larger framework. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I'm afraid we are uh, running out of time uh, a little bit. Um, and uh, I also realized that uh, it has been a very long uh, session. Um, are there is there any any question or any comment that uh, one of you might have? It could be uh, one of the authors or perhaps the participants or um, uh, the the local experts who have made the lesson plan. Any final round? Oh, I see some you and I. <laughs> you're raising your hand. I have one question for you, Anna, uh, because uh, I would I would like to ask if. She tried the strategy already with the students, or if she will uh, try it. If she plans to try it, I would like to, to ask what are the expect expectations that you will go into that uh, try? 
what do you think uh, students uh, will, will bring in or would explore through that uh, strategy? I actually tried it, but not with secondary school, but with uh, university students. And in fact, in different contexts, because um, I think I started um, at least twice the academic year with international students uh, for whom Wrocław was the new city. So uh, they, it was like their second week maybe in the city. And my idea was just to raise their interest in the uh, you know, complicated past uh, of the city and also uh, on the political changes. So it was um, focused less on the teaching strategy but on this particular content. Uh, so what was happening in Wrocław through ages and um, how it changed after World War II uh, and how it changed after 1989. And one particularly interesting thing in that particu particular path is that there is only one date dev devoted to the post-World War II, to the communist period. It's Festung Breslau 1945, so it's already German. And then there is the Solidarity Movement in 1980. So nothing, well, communism not mentioned uh, at all. And our class, following class, was going to deal about this abandoned uh, fragment about history of Poland and of uh, Wrocław and the communism. And the second context where I tried this strategy was with prospective teachers uh, during their class on history didactics. And there I rather paid attention on how to uh, focus students' attention, pupils' attention on the excursion, because it's uh, also one of the challenges that we face. Um, yeah, I can see quite often a group of pupils on this history pa historical path, you know, with a guide speaking something and all the pupils doing their own things. And the further they are from the guide, the less they are interested in what's going on and more interested in their own um, mobile phones and all this stuff. So it was my idea how to focus everybody's attention uh, on what's going on, thanks to the worksheets, which I am not very enthusiastic about, but it is a kind of uh, the activity they have to do. And they do mostly, it's too difficult to do it by themselves. They have to discuss, reflect um, together, for example, whether it's part of social or political or cultural history, especially that it was an interesting outcome of the last excursion that many events had different layers. So it was really difficult to say whether it was just political history uh, or just local history. We also tried to place it that way. That, okay, it was regional, but it had also um, national or international importance. So I looked at it from, from this side and I think it also worked. So they could see that at least they themselves uh, remained uh, engaged in, in, in the excursion, though they got very cold at the end. They, they, they did not uh, want to follow the 21st century, which is also kind of practical when you are at the excursion. OK, well. Um... I would like to thank all of you for today's uh, live reflection session. Uh, I know that we will probably have a lot of questions uh, and the discussion could go on for quite some time. Um, uh, but I, uh, yeah, I think we, uh, we have to uh, round it up here. Um, my special thanks go to, uh, well, of course, the participants that are here online with us, but the authors for taking the time to reflect on the uh, on the strategies and um, oh that's great to hear Nadezhda you will be using the strategy great and uh, of course Bista and Yurai also for being here and uh, sharing uh, your insights I think that's uh, that's also very uh, yeah it's been a very very nice to hear so thank you and um, yeah so um it will be, uh, the recording will be published on the YouTube channel as well, alongside uh, with all the pre-recorded sessions and the other live reflection sessions. 
And um, like we uh, yeah, also mentioned uh, earlier, the lesson plans that Uri and Bistra created will be uh, available on our website very soon. So um, yeah, for now, uh, thank you very much. And we hope to see you uh, very soon again. Thank you. Thank you and bye.